In this lesson, we'll study three important and interrelated geographic terms. These are location, space, and place. Our goal is to be able to distinguish between these three so that we can use them later in our discussions and in our analysis. So first, let's talk about location. Location is, of course, very important in geography. And we communicate where something is by specifying its location. And there are basically two ways that we can do this. The first is by specifying the relative location, and the other is by specifying absolute location. Relative location gives position based on the location of something else. If you say that Tennessee is directly north of Alabama, then you're providing a relative location for Tennessee. Provided that you already know where Alabama is, then you should be able to find Tennessee. Absolute location is different, and we often associate absolute location with providing coordinates. Most of the time, the system of coordinates we use to specify location on the planet is latitude and longitude. So if I specify that the phenomenon that we're interested in is at 45 degrees north and 17 degrees west, then I've specified what, for our purposes here, we'll understand as an absolute location. But of course, in order for the other person to understand those coordinates, he or she must also understand the system of latitude and longitude that you're using to express them. Now let's talk about the difference between space and place. I think that one of the best ways to illustrate the difference between these two is to think about your commute from home to work or from home to school or wherever it is that you regularly go. Let's say that you're going from home to work. Your home is probably a very significant place to you. You have made all kinds of memories there, and when you're there, you probably feel comfortable and safe. In short, you've imbued your home with a lot of meaning. Probably there's a similar situation at your work. There are different memories there, and it has a different kind of meaning to you, but still you have uh, imbued that area, that location, with a lot of meaning uh, to you from your time working there. Maybe you don't like work, and so the emotions that are invoked by work are rather negative, but that's okay for the purposes of illustrating space and place. You know, it could be the same way with your home. You might feel rather negatively about it. Uh, for instance, if it's your childhood home that you're thinking of, and you have had an unhappy childhood. I hope not, but uh, that could be the case. The important thing here for this illustration is that each of these places have meaning to you. When you travel between these two places, you probably take a similar route, and probably even the exact same route every day. Maybe you drive it, maybe you ride a bike, or use public transportation to move from home to work. But regardless of what mode of transportation you use, I know that it's probably an experience that all of us have had when you're leaving home and suddenly you arrive at work and you realize that you can't actually remember the drive between home and work. You must have done it because you did arrive, but you seem to have essentially been on autopilot during that time. Maybe you were thinking about something else or listening to the radio. In this example, you have clearly traversed space. There is a distance that you have to overcome in order to get from home to work. You have to move through space. But chances are most of that route does not have the same kind of meaning to you that home and work does. You're moving through space in order to get to those places which have been imbued with meaning to you. If you were trying to draw a map of the route between home and work, and I really ask you to think hard about everything that there was along that route, how much of it would you really be able to fill in anyway? You may be conscious of a lot less of it than you realize. Perhaps there's a gas station at which you frequently stop to fill up, or you, and you know which corner that's on. Maybe there's a grocery store that you often stop on your way home to pick up a few items. But beyond that, there's probably vast amounts of space along this route that you are not able to fill in because you don't have a conscious connection with them. You may have also had the experience of needing a particular kind of store and then looking up where it is online. When you see where they're located, it happens to be some place that you reasonably regularly pass by. It just so happens that you haven't ever noticed them before. That's filling in a little bit of that empty space with a little bit of meaning and significance and making you conscious of a new place within all of that space.
When I teach this in the classroom, I like to illustrate space and place by doing cognitive mapping. It's an excellent exercise, and I recommend that you take a few minutes to try it out. Cognitive mapping is a technique that's often used in geographic research, and also in a lot of different fields. Basically, what you do is ask someone, or sometimes a series of people if you're trying to collect data for a research project, to draw a map of a particular area from memory without any kind of visual aid. In order to illustrate space and place, I typically ask students to draw a map of some place they know very well. Since many of my students live in dorm rooms or in the campus apartments, I ask many of them to draw a map of the campus. If you're at a place where you can, I highly recommend that you take out a blank sheet of paper and spend two or three or four minutes trying to draw out a map of campus from memory. Now, once I've given students a few minutes to do this and their maps are complete, I ask them to share their maps so that we can compare and contrast them. What you inevitably find is that even if the maps are of the same location, for example, of the college campus, the students' maps are all very different because they understand the campus as a place very differently from one another. Of course, some students have greater spatial awareness than others, and so are able to draw more accurate maps from the perspective of scale, orientation, and direction. But beyond that, it's very clear that different students have different perceptions of the campus as a place. You can tell which particular parts of campus a student has a particularly strong sense of place regarding because of what they put down on their map and what level of detail different areas of campus are shown and what areas don't show up at all. For instance, it's pretty common for students to represent their dorm or apartment complex and the dorm or apartment complex of their significant other and the building that houses the department of their major. They probably know the route from these two buildings rather well and important landmarks along that route often feature prominently. Of course, which of these are represented will vary depending on the student, but on the whole, those kinds of locations are important to students, and so they feature prominently on the maps because they're imbued with such a strong sense of place. But then you start to look for things that show up on some maps, but not on others. For instance, one student's map included all of the parks and natural features on campus in great detail. This student was able to very accurately show the location of different ponds on campus and even where all the picnic benches were and even included her favorite tree that she liked to study under. These were very important to her and she had a lot of emotional investment in this place. On other people's maps, they weren't present at all. In fact, on many maps, they were lost in the blank space between other features that were more important to the person. Maybe in some case the pond was represented by a rather amorphous shape, vaguely implying the presence of the pond. Certainly, that was a space to a student like that, but they didn't really have a sense of place regarding it. They didn't have that connection to it that some other students did. So we should be coming to an understanding of the difference between space and place. We can talk about this on an individual level, as we just did, but we can also talk about it as far as the meanings to groups of people go. Society can imbue locations with meaning and establish a sense of place. And of course, the same place can have very different meanings for and invoke very different emotions in different peoples and different groups of people. This can have significance even on a geopolitical level. Consider what images appear in your mind and what emotions are invoked in you when I say the names of certain places. Eastern Europe Ukraine Iraq North Korea Costa Rica Afghanistan. You probably had a mental picture appear in your mind when I said the names of these places. You can consider what meaning you attach to them and then also consider how that might be different from the meanings and the mental images that appear to other students in the course. At a broader level, you might think about whether or not the meaning that you attach to that place is shared by other members 
of groups to which you belong. For instance, other people of your age group, your gender, your nationality, other people uh, from your hometown or the particular region of the country that you're from. Do groups that you belong to share a similar sense of place about certain locations? Why might they share that same sense of place? You could also consider if the perceptions of a place that you have might be very different from other members of the group to which you belong. And if so, why would that be? It could be because of personal experiences that you've had. For instance, most 19-year-olds in the United States will have not been to Afghanistan and therefore might share a certain sense of place regarding it. But if you're a 19-year-old who had been part of the armed forces and been deployed to Afghanistan, then your sense of place regarding Afghanistan is probably very different. Of course, in that circumstance, that person would be belonging to a group of people who had been deployed to Afghanistan during, in the armed forces and would probably share, perhaps, uh, some similarities in their sense of place of Afghanistan. Let me give you another example. What kind of sense of place do you associate with the United States? What kind of images appear in your mind when I say the United States? What kind of meaning do you associate with it? What sorts of emotions are invoked when you think about the United States? Do you think that those images, meanings, and emotions are shared by others that are in the same groups to which you belong? If you think they might be different, how might they be different? Now I want you to think about the sense of place regarding the United States that uh, might be invoked to different people from all different places in the world who belong to very different groups than you belong to. How might the perception of the United States as a place vary to all different people across the world? It's important to understand that the sense of place that we have about different locations have often been constructed by different groups of people, either deliberately or unintentionally. So in the next lesson, we'll take a look at different ways that a sense of place can be constructed. 